One of the more interesting GNU slash Linux distributions out there is Void Linux. What is Void Linux? It's an independent Linux distribution, meaning it's not based on Debian or Ubuntu or Arch. Void is its own thing. It has its own repository of software. It has its own package manager called XBPS. It has a couple of different versions. Uh, you can get Void Linux using glibc, which is the GNU C libraries, or you can get a Void Linux using MUSL, which is an alternative to glibc. It's more minimal, less uh, of a code base. Uh, it's more suckless, I guess, than glibc. Void Linux is very much kind of suckless in philosophy. It doesn't have System D as its init system. It uses its own Runit init system, and it's really interesting. I have I've looked at Void a couple of times before on the channel, but it's been a while, so today what I wanted to do is I was going to go to the Void Linux website and grab one of the latest ISOs and run through an installation. So let me switch over to the browser here, and on voidlinux.org, which is the website, you click on the download link and you get to the download page. And of course, they have a couple of different images here, x86-64 is of course what I'm going to be using. They do have 32-bit uh, images. It looks like they also have an ARM image as well. That could be interesting uh, on our Raspberry Pi. Or, or something like that. I, I, I might play with that. Actually, I didn't realize Void had ARM images. But today I'm going to grab the x86-64 image and they have some uh, pre-built ISOs as far as they've got uh, desktop environments already ready to go. You've got the, the base ISO, then you've got Enlightenment, Cinnamon, LXDE, LXQt, Mate, and XFCE. I'm going to grab the XFCE edition and I'm going to grab the MUSL edition rather than the glibc. Now if I was installing this on real hardware, on a real machine, typically I choose glibc just for stability reasons, just because most things expect glibc to be on the system. But uh, I, I just want to see how the installation goes with the MUSL edition of XFCE. So I'm going to grab that ISO and then I'm going to go ahead and spin up a quick virtual machine inside Vert Manager. So I created a virtual machine here. I gave this virtual machine six gigs of RAM. I gave it two threads of my 24 thread thread ripper and we get to the boot menu here and I'm just going to go ahead and boot directly into the live environment. And we've booted into the live environment. Of course, this is the XFCE desktop environment. Before I run through the installation, I am going to uh, search for the display program here inside XFCE. So it's called display settings. I'm going to go ahead and pick a screen resolution that makes more sense. I'm going to change to 1920 by 1080. Tell it to keep that resolution. Now let's go ahead and run through the installation of Void Linux. First, you need to open a terminal. There is a terminal docked by default in the XFCE desktop environment. I believe Control-Alt-T would also bring up a terminal. Yep, yeah, that brings up a terminal. Now let me zoom in a little bit so you can see the installation process. First, let's switch over to the root user. Uh, it's asking for a root password. I'm assuming Void Linux. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> All right. So typically in Linux distributions, if the root password is needed in a live environment, try either the word live, the word root, or the name of the distribution. So uh, luckily uh, it was Void Linux. Uh, I'm sure in the documentation on Void's website it would have told me that, but I, I don't have the installation guide in front of me. And then what you need to do, of course, as root is type void-installer. And you get this nice incurses installer here. And I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. And let's go ahead and set up our keyboard. And it looks like by default it's chosen ANSI Dvorak, which is probably not right for 99.99% .99 of the people on the planet. Uh, but I guess they just don't choose a default. You actually have to go through the list. Obviously, I'm going to want a US keyboard. So I type U to get to the U's. And then I scroll down to US and yeah, hit OK. And then let's set up the network. In the network, it should do this automatically. Just hit OK. Do you want to use DHCP? Yes. And that should set up our Ethernet there. Network is working properly, so hit OK. Then source. Set the source installation. Now you have two choices here. You have local and you have network. And you many people would think, well, I'll just use the network like an internet install and get the latest and greatest packages. You probably want to choose local though, because this will install packages from the ISO we downloaded. It's going to install all the XFCE packages, the full desktop environment and the suite of applications that we expect to find. So choose local, host name. Now this is the host name of the machine. I'm going to call it vert void, just so it's descriptive. I have a lot of 
uh, virtual machines and sometimes I SSH into them. So it's nice to have a descriptive host name for each machine. Uh, time zone. So this is for me, uh, the central time zone in the US. I'm going to choose America and I'm going to type C because I typically choose Chicago in these lists just because I know it's there and Chicago is in the central time zone. I'm not actually in Chicago, of course. And then root password. So let's create a strong and complicated password for the root user. And then verify that and then the user account so let's create a home user so what is our login name our login name does not need to be void i'm going to call my user dt and then the username of dt and then create a strong and complicated password for the dt user all right and then what groups should the dt user be a member of by default it's already put dt as a member of the wheel group the wheel group is very important that gives us sudo privileges and it looks like they've chosen some other sensible groups for him to be a member of such as floppy audio video uh, cd-rom and optical so that makes sense kvm so we have uh, the ability to use kvm virtual machines uh, if this was uh a situation where I was doing this install on a physical machine, the ability to have access to virtual machines would be very important for the DT user. So I'm just going to go with the defaults here and hit OK. Now the bootloader. Uh, what disk are we installing the bootloader to? I only have one virtual disk in this virtual machine, so there's only one to choose from. Use a graphical terminal for the bootloader, yes. And then partition. Partition the disk. So... I only have one drive to partition, so I'm going to select that. What tool do I want to use to partition the disk? We have CF disk and we have F disk as options. I'm really comfortable with CF disk, although I can use F disk, but I'm going to choose CF disk. It's just a very easy uh, command line tool. So in CF disk, when you first launch it, it asks, what do you want to set up? GPT or DOS partition table? If I'm doing a master boot record, I would do DOS. If I was doing UEFI, I would do GPT. I'm going to do a DOS partition. And I'm going to go ahead and create a swap just for purposes of this video. I normally wouldn't create a swap in a VM, but hey, why not? So I'm going to hit enter on new. And partition size, I'm going to do a one gig swap. No reason to make it, you know, very big here. I'm going to hit enter on primary and then um, that's really all I needed on that. Then I'm going to hit the arrow key down to free space, do new, and then the next partition size, 24 gigs. That's all of the remaining space on the drive. I'm going to hit enter, primary. Yeah, and we created a 1 gig partition and a 24 gig partition. Now the 1 gig partition, the type is Linux. We want to change the type. So I'm going to change that to Linux swap. And the other one, well, the default type is Linux, a Linux file system, so that is correct for the second partition. Then what we want to do is we want to write that. You have to type the full word yes to write. And then once you've written it, quit. All right, and now file systems. Configure file systems and mount points. So VDA1 was the swap, so it needs to be Linux swap. So VDA1 was a swap. VDA2, of course, will be our real file system, I'm going to do extend 4, ext4. The mount point, I'm going to do as root, and hit OK. Do you want to create a new file system on slash dev slash VDA2? Yes. And uh, I think we're done. I don't know why it still says file system type as none on both of them, even though I selected swap and extend 4. I'm assuming that's just a bug in the installer. I'm going to choose done and hope this works out. And then let's go ahead and go to the install says, warning, data on partitions will be completely destroyed for new file systems. Do you want to continue? And it, you notice VDA1 mounted on swap as swap, VDA2 mounted on root as extend4. So it does recognize that I want these as a swap and an extend4 partition. So I'm going to choose yes to go ahead and format the drive and start the installation. I don't know how long the installation process will be. I don't think void has a ton of packages installed by default, so it should be a rather quick installation process. And it says Void Linux has installed correctly. Do you want to reboot your system? Yes. By the way, the installation took like two minutes. <laughs> that was a very fast installation. So it's rebooted and we get a grub menu, so it looks like the installation worked just fine. So let's go ahead and boot into our freshly installed Void Linux. We get our login manager, so let me log in. And we get the XFCE desktop. Once again, let me look for the display settings and fix the resolution. 
And I'm going to choose 1920 by 1080 again, keep this configuration. And now it, it should remember the 1920 by 1080 resolution from here on out every time I come back to this VM. Uh, it wouldn't remember it in the live environment, of course, because nothing is saved in the live environment. But now that we've got it actually installed, we should never have to do that again. Now, there's not much to look at as far as the desktop environment suite of applications installed because Void is very vanilla. This is a very vanilla XFCE. This is straight XFCE as it comes from XFCE. It's a standard default look with the XFCE dock down here with a few icons in the dock. And you got your applications menu, this old school Windows 98 applications menu and you've got the standard suite of xfce applications plus some other stuff we do have a web browser firefox was installed for us uh, under graphics we have the ristretto image viewer under accessories uh just mouse pad thunar the standard xfce stuff there's really not much here and that's kind of cool I, I like minimal installations because i'd rather pick my own suite of software you know if i want an office suite i'll install it if i want a bunch of multimedia programs i'll install it and really i think the main thing i should show you guys is some of the under the hood stuff with void because that's really what separates void so i'm going to open a terminal and let me zoom in again and let's go ahead and play around with the package manager void has its own custom package manager called xbps and if i go to the, the Void website. They do have a nice page explaining the package manager and the various commands with the XBPS package manager. You use XBPS-query to search for packages, XBPS-install to install packages, and XBPS-remove to remove packages. Those are the three most commonly used commands there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get back into the desktop and let's go ahead and run some of these XBPS commands. So I'm going to do, um, we should update the system because I don't know how old this ISO was and we installed packages from the ISO. So let's go ahead and sync the repositories and actually update the system. So I'm going to do sudo XBPS dash install and then give it this flag dash S for sync the repositories dash U to update the packages. And it's asking for a root password. So give it your super secure and strong complicated root password. And it says the XBPS package must be updated. So before we can actually use XBPS, we've got to update the package manager itself. So let's do XBPS-install-u to update. And the package we want to update is XBPS. All right. So let's go ahead and update the package manager. And then once we've got the package manager updated, I'm going to up arrow and run the command to actually update everything on the system. So that's XBPS install dash capital S lowercase u. And this time it works just fine. It looks like, yeah, there's a lot of things to update. I'm going to go ahead and run this update. I'm going to pause the video. So we've updated all the packages on the system and looking at the documentation for XBPS, uh, it does mention about restarting services after you do a uh, system update with XBPS install su. It says XBPS does not restart services when they are updated. So to find processes that are running different versions that are present on the disk, you should run the X check restart tool provided by the X tools package. And you should run this as an unprivileged user, meaning don't use uh, sudo for this. So I'm actually going to do that. Let's see if we find any uh, processes that needed to be restarted. So if I do X check restart, uh, that command is not found. The documentation did say it was part of a package called xtools. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sudo xbps-install and then do xtools. And then it's going to ask for the root password. And then it's going to install a few things. Looks like some uh, Perl libraries. And now that I've got those installed, let me do xcheck restart one more time. And yes, there were a number of programs running on the system. Uh, that needed to be restarted. Another thing I want to do is I do want to do an install of HTOP because I would like to check system resource usage using HTOP. All right, now that we've got HTOP installed, let me go ahead and run that. And wow, 289 megs of RAM of the six gigs of RAM I gave this machine. Now this really shows you how minimal and how suckless 
void Linux as a distribution is. The reason it's only using 289 megs of RAM is because nothing's really here. Nothing is installed. There's very few background daemons running. So it's a really, really minimal distribution. Now, once you install start installing a lot of programs and you're going to start a lot of services. You're going to have a lot of background daemons running in the background once you put, you know, your full suite of software here. You know, that number is going to crawl back up, but still, that's still really small for XFCE. Uh, even XFCE, even though it's light, typically when I do standard XFCE distributions, it's using 500 megs of RAM typically. This thing was using about half of that. While we're at the command line, let's go ahead and do a uname-r to get the kernel, kernel version 5.10.17. So pretty recent kernel, uh, not terribly bleeding edge, but pretty new. The next thing I want to do is I want to search for some software because if I was going to use void Linux on like one of my main machines, I would need to know that certain programs were available in the repository. So let's use xbps-query to search for software. Give it this flag, dash capital R lowercase s. This searches for programs on the repositories, on the remote repositories. What am I searching for? I would like to know if xmonad is available. Yes, there's two xmonad programs in the repository, xmonad, which is the tiling window manager, and xmonad-contrib, which is those third-party libraries needed to make xmonad, xmonad. How about xmobar, because I'm going to need the panel for it as well. Yeah, that's there as well. Uh, is there anything else I would be interested in? Qtile, not a lot of distributions package Qtile. There's still several distributions that don't have Qtile in their repositories. Debian, for one, actually doesn't have Qtile in the repositories. Neither does Void, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm not too surprised at that. I would assume the Awesome Window Manager would be packaged. It's way too popular not to be the, yeah, of course, Awesome. Awesome's been around since the beginning of time. Everybody should have that in their repositories. Now, another cool flag that you can use with xbps-query is the dash L flag for list of the packages that are installed or on your system. So this gives you a list of all the packages installed on the system. Unfortunately, uh, we want to uh, get a count of that, so I could pipe that through WC and then dash L. And we get 547 lines in that list. That means there's only 547 packages installed. If you wanted to get a list of actual the package names for maybe you wanted to create your own script to deploy all of these programs later, you could actually pipe this into a program like awk. You guys know I love to do awk. And of course, what you want to do is print out the second column because the first column are these two eyes and that is not needed. All we want is the second column. We also didn't want the third column, which was the description. That actually gives you the package names. Unfortunately, it gives you the uh, package version numbers as well. So that actually would not work if you were creating a like a deployment script. So you would want to remove the uh, the numbers at the end here. Now, looking at the documentation for XBPS, they actually tell you how to get rid of the numbers in that xbps query dash l command. You pipe it through awk like we did to get the second column, that made sense, but then you need to pipe it into xorgs, and then with xorgs you need to pass the command on to xbps dash u helper. And apparently that has a function in it called get package name, where it gets the package names without those numbers. So let's actually try that out. Since I only need to do one more pipe, Let's pipe it into xargs and give xargs this flag dash n1. And then we're passing all of this information on to xbps dash u helper and then get pkg name. And now we get an actual list. And if you wanted to, you could then take that list and then direct that to a file, for example, packages.txt. And now when I do a ls here, you see packages.txt. If I open that in Vim, I'm assuming Vim is installed. It is not. Oh my goodness. Do I really have to use nano? Nano's not installed either. So that's, there's only one other thing I can try. VI, of course, is going to be here. And that's our package list. So now this makes it very easy later if you want to you know, reproduce this exact same void setup. You've got your list of programs that were installed. Well, let me quit out of VI. Uh, the only other thing other than the package manager that really separates Void, of course, and, and the real reason Void has such a, a big following is a lot of people, of course, don't like systemd as an init system. And Void has their own 
uh, init system called run it. Uh, they've been using it forever and it's a really simple init system, not a lot of lines of code to it and it's pretty easy to use. Actually, a lot of the run it commands are very similar to your system CTL commands that you use with system D. For example, those of you that are used to uh, system D know this command here, system uh, CTL status and then name of service. You know, so if I was checking on the status of UFW, the uncomplicated firewall, it's not installed here on Void, but you know, that's how you would do that with system D. Uh, in Void, what you would do is instead of system CTL status, it would be SV for services, status, and then name of service. And of course, you have to be root, or you have to have sudo privileges here to run the status command and run it. You do not have to be root to run the status command with system D. So that is one difference. And of course, UFW is not installed. Let's pick a service we know is installed. So I'm going to do DHCP CD. And that was, of course, our, our networking daemon. And you see, now we get some information returned and it's giving us uh, 84 seconds normally up. So let's talk about turning on and off services or, you know, starting and stopping them. So instead of uh, start, you use up to start a service. So sudo sv up name of service would start it. sudo down uh, name of service would stop it. And then of course we've already talked about the status command and then you also have restart. And of course that would restart a service. So pretty similar to how you start and stop services and restart services with system D, very similar to how you do it also in open RC. It's one of the reasons why I tell you guys, I re really don't care about the init systems that come install on my Linux distributions, system D run it open RC. I can take any of them. I can leave any of them. It, it really doesn't matter to me these days though. I, I, Typically, I would prefer to have system D on the system because there's too many things now. There's too many pieces of software out there, unfortunately, that have hard dependencies on system D. For example, I still sometimes like to install snap packs and snap still has a hard dependency on system D, unfortunately, which means you could not actually install snaps on a distribution like void. Let me minimize this terminal. I may come back to it. I want to right click on the desktop. And I'm going to go to desktop settings. Let's see if there's any wallpapers to choose from. No. So no wallpaper packs were installed. This is the standard XFCE wallpaper pack, which just has four wallpapers in it. And they're all a picture of the XFCE mouse and the little mascot. So let's install some wallpaper packs uh, because this is going to be one of the first things people want to do. When you install a plain vanilla desktop environment like this, you know, you want some icon sets, and GTK themes and all of that. I'm not going to install all of that on camera, but I'll show you how you would do this what you would do is you would do the xbps dash query command again and then let's do dash rs to search in the repositories and then i'm going to search for backgrounds and there are two wallpaper packs gnome dash backgrounds and mate dash backgrounds and those are actually much nicer wallpaper packs than the xfce ones so now what you would want to do if you've wanted both of these is do a sudo xbps dash install and then those packages so i'm going to do gnome dash backgrounds and mate dash backgrounds and give it your sudo password and i love how it tells you that it's the space available on the disk when you're installing software it lets me know i've got 20 gigs of space available on this disk that is a really nice touch actually especially in a VM where you can actually run out of space rather quickly when you start installing especially big programs. And now that it's, that is installed, I'm going to go ahead and close the terminal. And now I'm going to go to desktop settings. And now the folder I want is, let's go to other. And we want to go to user, share, backgrounds, and instead of XFCE, let's go into the GNOME folder here. And then open. And now we get the GNOME wallpaper pack. And yeah, these are much nicer wallpapers. You guys have seen many of these wallpapers. It's just the standard GNOME wallpaper pack. Yeah, that one's really nice, even though it's hot as Hades outside here in Louisiana at this time of year. Uh, but it does cool me off a little bit to have a wintry photo there.
anyway, that wallpaper, there's just a nice touch. It's still a very plain vanilla XFCE desktop environment. Of course, you can customize it to your heart's content. This was really just a very cursory look at Void Linux. Really what I wanted to share with you guys is the installation process and some of the under the hood stuff, how it differs than most GNU slash Linux distributions. Obviously, it has the, its own unique packages and repositories, its own package manager, and of course, it uses the run it init system. Now, before I go, I want to thank a few special people. I want to thank the producers of this episode. Absy Gabe, James Mitchell, Paul, Scott, Wes, Akami, Allen, Chuck, Kurt, David, Dylan, Gregory, Heiko, Mike, Erjan, Alexander, Peace, Arch, and Fedor, Polytech, Raver, Red Prophet, Stephen, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode about Void Linux would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. These names you're seeing on the screen, these are all my supporters over on Patreon. Because I don't have any corporate sponsors, I'm just sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to help me out, consider supporting DistroTube over on Patreon. Alright guys, peace. Not having Qtile is a total deal breaker.